Last time, we looked at the cultural myths that inhibit us from setting a healthy mindset, like the myth of economic growth. We now seek tools and techniques to re-educate ourselves to overcome those myths. Fortunately, the time-honored teachings of the world's religions, the investigations of science, and indigenous ways of knowing all provide us counterpoints. Let's first take science. Many of the earlier answers to what's working and what's not working come from the investigations of science, specifically the natural and physical sciences like geology and ecology. If scientists led changing the rules of the game, key rules would have changed. However, the social sciences also provide further validation. Economist E.F. Schumacher, a leading thinker of the 20th century, stated, it is therefore rationally justifiable to say, as a statement of fact, that land and the creatures upon it are in a certain sense sacred. Man has not made them, and it is irrational for him to treat things that he has not made and cannot make, and cannot recreate, in the same manner and spirit as things of his own making. Schumacher is pushing against the notion that we should be doing cost-benefit analyses on nature and natural capital in the same way we do equipment and other capital of human creation. The environment is literally priceless. This pricelessness stems from the fact that we are not able to create natural capital in the same way as our other assets. Economists talk about three factors of production. Labor, which means people, to treat people as factors of production is already a bit far-fetched. Land and capital. Of these three, only capital is man-made and can be pushed around. Land certainly is not man-made. And as long as land is an object of speculation or speculative investment, none of these problems can be solved. Nobel laureate Eleanor Ostrom, Herman Daly, and many others have helped create the field of environmental economics precisely to capture and better investigate this notion. Next, let's take religion. Balance with life on the planet is inherent in the vast array of indigenous religions that arose across the planet. Those religions continue today. Chief Oren Lyons of the Onondaga underscores our mandate for action, saying, in our perception, all life is equal, and that includes the birds, animals, things that grow, things that swim. All life is equal in our perception. It is the creator who presents the reality, and you are a manifestation of the creation. You must consider how will this affect the seventh generation. Will people of all races reach beyond feelings of racism and antagonism to see what is good for the welfare of all people? And not only all people, but of all things that live? And the Bill of Rights is what you called it. And our instruction has always been about responsibility. So it should have been a Bill of Responsibility. If it was a Bill of Responsibility, I think we'd be in better shape today. Rebecca Adamson of the Cherokee and founder of the First Nations Development Institute also reinforces Oren Lyons, saying, there is an emerging recognition of the need for a spiritual base, not only in our individual lives, but also in our work in our, in our communities. Perfect harmony and balance with the laws of nature means that we know that the way of life is found by protecting the water beings. The indigenous understanding has its basis of spirituality and recognition of the interconnectedness and interdependence of all living things. All things are bound together, all things connect. But what will he do when God's lovingly created planet comes under attack? If we destroy creation, creation will destroy us. From a Jewish perspective, Rabbi Michael Lerner asserts that it is through a poverty of spirit that we allow ecological destruction to happen. In his book, Spirit Matters, he shows how deeply we've been hurt, not only ecologically, but also emotionally and spiritually and politically by living in a world that systematically represses our spiritual needs. Saying, 
our next stage requires that we take the next step in the evolution of consciousness and begin to see ourselves as one, as deeply connected, sharing one planet. The idea of our fundamental interconnection with each other and with nature was already articulated in the Bible when its prophets warned that without a society based on justice, peace, love, and caring, the whole world will face ecological catastrophe. In 1993, the Evangelical Lutheran Church of America issued Caring for Creation, Vision, Hope, and Justice, a statement to articulate the human role in stewarding the planet. Father Thomas Berry of the Catholic tradition asserts, only if we have a beautiful world can we have a beautiful mind and a beautiful soul. We must come to see the human species and other species as a single community. This work was affirmed in mainstream Catholicism by the groundbreaking encyclical from the Pope in 2015, which asserted the need for climate action, among other things, for the health of Sister Mother Earth in which documented the steady trajectory of popes over the past 50 years toward this position. Similarly, Islamic scholars gathered in August of 2015 to affirm a statement very similar to that of Pope Francis. Regarding the gifts of the planet, these scholars note, our attitude to these gifts has been short-sighted and we have abused them. What will future generations say of us who leave them a degraded planet as our legacy? How will we face our Lord and Creator? At the nexus of science and spiritual belief are movements like deep ecology. In deep ecology, people very fundamentally ask which society, which education, which form of religion is most beneficial for life on the planet, and then how do we make the necessary changes to bring that about? The assumptions of deep ecology include human beings are just one species in the community of nature and all beings are intrinsically equal. Everything is connected, and the interrelationships are constantly changing. Instead of economic growth, deep ecology assumes ecological sustainability and requires a long-term view. It is nature and not people which take prime importance in deep ecology. Deep ecology, this sacred worldview, was the life and practice of all primitive peoples. And it will be the worldview once again of any peoples to survive the Earth's cataclysmic cleansing. This perspective speaks exactly to the drastic action that we need to take and emphasizes that humans are rightly in service to the environment rather than the reverse. As we see, there are many paths to proper mindset. With proper mindset leading to proper goals, we are set to change the rules. So life was sent into the dream to make it real and for creator spirits to continue the dreaming. So the spirit of all life sent the secret of dreaming into the world. The second teaching was the teaching of love, which was symbolized by the ego. It has always been understood, the essence and the spirit that is within each of us.